Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I'm a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Each week, I interview some of the best minds on the planet on the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. I remember just thinking over and over again, like, I have zero control over the outcome of what's going to happen tomorrow. I may, I may be driving back to New, New Jersey in 10 years. I think a lot of people look at having some, some troubles and coming through them and, and, and having some success. And in spite of my situation, in spite of my biology or geography, I was able to achieve this. Lately, I've been thinking pretty opposite of that. All of these different acts are just another chapter in my story. And if I can spend the rest of my life passing those, those lessons learned down onto other people, it will all have been worth it, worth it, worth it. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. This episode features Mike Parnell. You can find him on Facebook and elsewhere at Michael Parnell. Okay, I wanted to have Michael on the show for a few reasons. I met him through my wife, Kim, at a Lewis Howes event, the Summit of Greatness. We had dinner together and I just thought, you know, this is an interesting guy. He's a really successful guy. He's really, really interesting. And then later I found out his story from how he grew up and the immense challenges that he had to overcome to get to where he is today. And I wanted you to hear this story because it's real. It's unfiltered and honest. And the truth is something that just never happens anymore. And I think he's probably a bit nervous about sharing this. And I find him to be incredibly courageous for his willingness to do this. He's figured out how cleaning up these areas in his life and being honest about them is what's allowing him to move forward in creating a more fulfilling life, which is exactly why I created the Work Hard, Play Hard Mastermind to help people get more fulfillment in their life. And we're going to do it through a ton of different ways. So if you are a type A overachiever, entrepreneur that is spending way too much time in front of your computer and you don't have a tribe to do the things that you want to do with and you're not living the life that you want to live, Come join us in 2019 in Boston, Monaco, and Italy. We are now more than half sold out. If you want to be a part of this with us, fill out the application at workhardplayhardmastermind.com and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a good fit for the group and if the group is a good fit for you. So think of the mastermind as having two parts. The first part is the trip itself. We'll be headed to Boston and doing things like meeting with Tom Brady's trainer at Gillette Stadium to get a metabolic baseline to help you improve the fitness part of your life. Going to south of France, where I'll have helicopters waiting for you in Nice to drop you into Monaco. And we'll wrap up the year having some fun in Italy doing things like truffle hunting. And the second part of the mastermind is what goes on over the four days in the mastermind. Our group of 25 entrepreneurs will help you brainstorm and accelerate what you want to achieve in 2019. And we'll do that through a variety of exercises or help you figure out what the next chapter is for you. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com, fill out the application, and we'll jump on a call to see if it's a great fit. All right. Enjoy this interview with Michael Parnell. Michael, welcome to the show. Rob, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. I, yeah, I am super excited uh, for this interview for so many reasons because I am mostly super proud of your willingness to take a vertical dive into your story that may be maybe someone listening will be able to gain some perspective and maybe it'll even help them as well. So as we unfold this story, I think a lot of it will be clear. So thank you for making the time. I, I appreciate it. Pre appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, you got it. So, okay, let's give some background here. You are a college friend of my wife's and you recently joined us at a Lewis Howes event called the Summit of Greatness. And while we were there, we were watching a screening of Lewis's new documentary, 
we were the, one of the first people to see it. Um, and in the documentary, we heard Lewis tell a story of how he just lost his shit on a basketball court, which was really out of character for him, if you know him. And he knew that there was something that was much deeper that was really bottling up inside of him. And you and I talked after that. And you, know, you told me that that really resonated with you and that, you know, you battled with your own anger issues and, you know, you were really having difficulty enjoying success in your life. You know, you'd have a good moment, maybe a big win in business, but it was always fleeting. And I really believe that so much of what informs who we are is a result of lots of things that have shaped our life. And today we're going to do a vertical dive into a few of the things that have shaped yours. So your willingness to be able to share your story, I think, is so important. You know, I have a lot of people on the show that are, you know, super high level entrepreneurs, celebrities, et cetera. But we all struggle with the same sorts of things and we all deal with anger issues. And, you know, you, just your ability to be able to go there um, is super commendable. So I just want to thank you for that. I appreciate that. You got it. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. So we're going to kind of just go through a, uh, a chronology. And as you're sort of answering the questions, we'll just, you know, go back and forth on just some gaps that we need to fill in for people. Cool? Excellent. Sounds good. All right. If we start at the very beginning, your dad left when you were about one and you never met him. What were the circumstances that led to that if you've been able to piece any of that together? So uh, my, my mother and biological father were, um, got married. At, uh, I think my mother was 18 or 18 when they were married. Uh, my biological was maybe 19 uh, at most. You know, really young, really uh, just out of high school. And my father was in the military. So they... Um, they, you know, got married and and off to uh, North Carolina for, uh, you know, the the Marines. That was always the story growing up: is that their situation fell apart and, you know, left. He just was was not involved. You know, zero involvement. Um, How did they meet each other? Um, you know, local. I think they were in like neighboring high schools. I never really, really, really heard that story actually, which is weird in itself, right? <laughs> Not really, because I'm not entirely sure I know how my parents met. So, uh, yeah, I, I get what I get what you're saying. So, basically, the, the bottom line is that they were super young. Mom was, you know, 18. Dad was around 19. Military situation going on. So, if we move along a few years, your mom remarried when you were around three, yeah. and your stepfather adopted you, but he was not involved very much in your life. But then they wound up getting divorced when you were 12 and then mm -hmm. you never saw him again. In what ways do you think that affected you during those years? And how do you think it's impacted you now? You know, having kids now, um, you know, can't, you can't even fathom not being involved in their lives. So it was hard. You know, it, it was hard to, I think uh, the start of the anger or the frustrations was just, being upset, you know, looking at other families with some involvement of both parents, even if they weren't all together, because most of us who were growing up in the 80s, the better majority were growing up in, in split households anyways. But there was always, typically always, both parents involved to some extent, you know, at a game, at a, you know, at a school function, you know, birthday parties. And, you, you know, I always felt like there was like that void, like I had no concept of a male presence. You know, I, I had no father, son, or, or kid male adult uh, presence other than uncles and, uh, you know, grandparents, of course. But that was always a void, you know, and, and for just learning, you know, learning how to, you know, the male point of view. I was typically always around, you know, women in my family and, and kids and you know, had had some had some male influences. My uncle was always a good influence, and my grandparents and grandfathers. But um, you know, that 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 connection was missing. 
but no direct paternal input because your stepfather really was not very involved when he was there. And then when he was gone, he disappeared. Yeah. I mean, you know, he didn't totally, the, the second one, <laughs> I'm like Tony Robbins, right? You know, my three fathers and my, my yeah. mother actually got married again when I was an adult. So I can re- re- really resonate with Tony on those, uh, on those comments, but yeah, when he, when he talks about my dad and he's like, which one? Right, right. He was kind of a non-factor. My, my second father was kind of a non-factor when we were growing up, uh, when he was in the house. You know, he was, he was at work or he'd go out after work a lot. You know, it, I never really had those, those many memories at all of like, you know, playing catch in the yard or driving to a soccer game or anything. Um, so it, it's hard to even really remember much. So when they did get divorced... We actually, we were living in New Hampshire. We lived in New Hampshire from second grade to eighth grade. And um, his family was from up there. We moved, we moved from New Jersey up to New Hampshire. He was, you know, kind of a non-factor when we were together. And, and once we, you know, split up, we ended up moving down to New Jersey and there was really no effort, effort there. So um, actually when I was in college, I, uh, I kind of wrote him a letter that, that, uh, you know, basically told him, you know, how I felt about the whole, you know, the whole situation it was right when I was graduating college, you know, there's, there's no anger there, but I don't want my kids to repeat this cycle. Uh, even though I was, you know, 23 at the time of writing this, but I knew that I didn't want that for my kids. And, and these cycles, you know, generational cycles repeat themselves, you know, more than anything, I didn't want them to have a grandfather on paper that, had no involvement, you know, with their lives, you know, saw them once a year, spoke to them once a year, you know, any of that. That's how my, my, my sister, who's actually my half sister, um, his biological daughter, you know, they have a very, a very distant relationship. And I think it's confusing for kids. So I didn't want that to be my kid's relationship with their grandfather. I would rather them just not know him. Um, So Mm -hmm. I basically told them that in a letter and said, you know, there's just, there's not enough of an involvement to, to add value to their life or my life. So let's, let's just not, you know, let's just cut it off where, where it is. And did he respond? He did. And he, and he responded with, with this kind of nasty, angry letter, kind of blaming my mother for the distance, you know, when we moved to New Jersey that, uh, you know, he was distant because, because my, my it mother, was it was uh, ge- ge- uh, geography, geography, and kind of saying like, you know, my mother's planning these thoughts in her head and yada, yada, yada. And uh, my mother's no angel for sure. Um, but, you know, we didn't, it didn't take a whole lot of brain power to understand that, you know, he's not making an effort, even a call. Uh, and he certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be, tr- we wouldn't be traveling down there. It's amazing when we look at our lives through the lens of our kids, you know, if you didn't have any kids, you would make radically different decisions on, you know, this subject, but because you do, you look at, you look at it through their eyes. And it's always interesting to me. Let's move along a little bit to around 16. Uh, You had a chance meeting with your dad, but by 18, he was gone again. Can you tell me about the, this is your biological dad. Can you tell me about the moment you first saw him and you know, not to get too woo-woo on you, but do you think it was a chance meeting or in retrospect, retrospect, do you think that you were sort of guided? Uh, it, was, it was definitely guided, you know, and it's, it's funny to say it was guided and, and it didn't work out. But uh, again, I think it's one of those things that happen that, that you're supposed to take something out of and, and learn from. And um, it took probably, you know, 20 years later to understand that. But for one of the first kids I was friends with when I moved to New when when I moved to New Jersey, owned an auto dealership, and I had some relatives. My, my aunt actually um, worked in finance, and she had said that once or twice over the years she came across m- my biological father. He he worked in an auto dealership and was applying for financing for one of his customers or whatever, and so I knew he worked at an auto, auto dealership. And that was it, and I never had any interest in trying to contact him or anything. You know, it, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was at this, this kid's house and uh, I just happened to ask him. And, and I don't know why I asked him, but I said, you know, d- does your father have a, a guy named uh, Mike Thorpe wor- you know, work for him? And he goes, yeah, he's worked there for like 10 years. And, and I was like stone-faced. I was like, mm. 
I can't believe this. Like, did that really just happen? We we started talking about that, and his mother, you know, he he we ran into, you know, he ran into the kitchen and was like, "Mom, you're not going to believe this." So his mother, you know, I think with good intentions, had an Oprah moment and uh, wanted to have this, you know, you know, reuniting. I was skeptical, but kind of interested. I mean, I was 16 years old, 15, 16 years old. It was just, you know, mind blowing that this actually, I, I might actually meet this person. Had no idea what to to expect from it. Was pretty nervous, but she set up a uh, intro. Uh, actually, at, down at the beach one day. Uh, we live in a, in a in a beach town, in New Jersey. It was very very awkward. After that, you know, a couple hours that day, he had called a few times to get together again, and I just really, I really wasn't comfortable doing it. So there was a bit of a separation again for probably about a year. And then I was starting to get in trouble a lot in high school, you know, outside of school. So my mother's boyfriend at the time thought it would be a good idea to try to get this, you know, biological father back into my life and kind of push it on me a little bit. And it was good, I think. I think it, it was good at the time. So I started to talk to him again a little more frequently. Uh, he actually <laughs> bought me my first car when I got my license. And uh, there was a little bit of a relationship there, and it, it wasn't. At, it was getting less awkward. And then I got this. You know, my 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 mother and her boyfriend had broken up, and I got this. Started to get this weird feeling like he was really just interested in getting back with my mother. So I, I kind of approached him one uh, one day about it, and um, I was I was doing some work for him. He had a side business um, decorating auto dealerships for different holidays, and uh, I was doing you know working with him. A lot on that uh, as a side job, you know, outside of school, and I was still in high school as a you know, senior. Being a kid, still, I were uh, and and really not having a long relationship with this guy. I, I I wrote him a letter. I said, you know, I I really I want to um, have a relationship with you, but I feel like this is you know that you are more interested in getting to you know back together with my mother than really. You know, having a father son relationship with me, and and more importantly, I'm starting to feel like I'm more of like just you know someone to work with, and and you know being an employee than you know a father son relationship, and that's not really what I'm interested in. So, if you'd like to have a father son relationship with me, then you know I'm all for it. But if not, then you know this you know I don't think we're this is going to work out. So during those first eighteen years, you moved a bunch of times. In fact, you moved 25 times, which I think may be a record in the world. Yeah. And you were you were not a military kid. So <laughs> what was responsible for all that moving and what negative associations did you start to get as a result of moving? You know, in hindsight, you know, my mother made a lot of rash decisions, I think, and was always kind of searching to how to be happy. So, you know, we'd be bouncing around. I mean, some of the moves were, you know, we were in an, an apartment, then we we're living with my grandparents. And then we were in a house and then she decided they were going to move to New Hampshire. So we moved in with my grandparents for a few months and then moved to New Hampshire. And then we were renting up there and we went from one rental to the next year, another rental to building a house. They, they built their own house and then their marriage fell, fell apart and we moved into a rental and moved another rental. And 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 a lot of those moves were in the same town, which I guess is a one benefit. I was in the same school system. You know, most of my formidable years, I was in, I was in the same high school all four years. Even though we lived in a summer or a winter rental in the off season during the school year, and then we would move the town next door uh, into my grandmother's house in, in the summer when the rentals were you know sky high, uh, you know, summer weekly rentals, um, living in a beach town. So. Yeah. So, okay. So all the way up until this point, so there's been a lot of things happening. And at some point with all of this happening, the negative effects have to show up as you move into, you know, this sort of like young adulthood. So let's call it, you know, the high school years. So in high school, you started with drugs and alcohol, getting in trouble Looking back on those years, what was the thing that was the most difficult for you? 
Looking back now, it was the stability. It was a lack of stability. And it's funny, if I, if I really look at it, whenever I, I was in an, in, a, in an athletic season, I, was, I had structure. You know, I'd, I'd be going to, going to class, going to practice, coming home, you know, game days, you know, practice or game on the weekends. And there was this, there was this structure to my life. And every single time that I would get in trouble and, and party a lot, would be when it, it would be in a season where I had no athletics involved. Mm, that's interesting. That comes up a lot in this podcast. Yeah, and, and 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 that's really you know now I can see, you know, and, and at the time you'd think you know oh is it boredom you know, uh, but it's it's lack of structure and uh, there was zero zero certainty in my life other than athletic seasons. So I really latched on to that, uh, and you know my all my friends were through athletics. The structure in my life was through athletics. So I was a happy, you know, structured kid in those times. And when those seasons ended and you're not seeing those same faces every day and, uh, you know, I'm, you know, coach, coaches you know, influence as well as a, as a positive adult influence in your life on a daily basis. Uh, that's when I really, you know, struggled and, and got into trouble. Let's move on to college. You went to a small college in North Carolina and the anger really started to rear its ugly head around that time. And you got into a fight in your dorm that, you know, ultimately almost wound up getting you expelled. Your grandmother died. You got arrested for stealing a Budweiser sign from a Budweiser dis distributor. You must've really wanted that sign. Can you, can you place us back on the day when you were arrested and tell us what you were feeling inside and maybe explain what those emotions were like, if you can, looking at through your adult lens now. Yeah, I went to a small school right before I got to school or, or to, to, to the college. My, the, the coach who recruited me left. My grandmother had my, my entire senior year, my grandmother had pancreatic cancer. Um, she made it from August diagnosis to the end of the following August when I was going into college before she passed away. Passed, you know, I, I basically had to go to training camp saying goodbye to her for the final time. Uh, she, would, she, would, she would end up dying a week later. Didn't train well um, going into that camp. Didn't make the team new coach. And you know, I just didn't, I wasn't in the physical condition I should have been. Didn't, wasn't committed enough. At that time, I really had zero, zero focus. You know, I, had, I had no direction you know, I was, I was at, at that point I was off at school just to party, you know, screwing around, not going to classes, you know, getting in trouble, you know, just, just, just zero focus. And, um, we were, we were, you know, a group of us were running around uh, one night and, uh, we were across the street at this Budweiser distributor. And I, I climbed like a 40 foot flagpole and was throwing down like all the different, you know, Budweiser brand flags down to, down to, uh, you know, the kids I was out with. And all of a sudden the cops showed up. I slide down the pole. We all run into the woods, getting chased by the cops, actually got away. And one of the kids got caught and uh, basically admitted to everything. And then they went around our dorm room and uh, our dorm and, you know, everybody who involved ended up getting arrested for it. That should have been a big turning point. And really the lesson didn't sink, sink in yet. You know, it was just another, another minor infraction in my head I really had no, you know, no direction. So I didn't really didn't feel like I was getting off, off base because I was getting in trouble in high school. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, it wasn't a, le a lesson I learned at the time, for sure. Yeah, you know, they say uh, first, uh, you know, first you get the whisper, then you get the knock on the head, and then you get the frying pan. So that was, you know, maybe the whisper that you ignored. But after that, you left. And you left that small college and you went to East Carolina University and that's where we pick up where you met my wife. So it's kind of interesting. I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this, that you knew my wife before I did, which is, <laughs> Kim which is was, really uh, kind of interesting. Kim might have been the first girl that I, that I met in college, actually. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay. And during that time, you wound up falling into uh, selling and using ecstasy, which was you know, on the one hand, helping you pay tuition and, you know, giving you the popularity of being the guy on campus. So it was, you know, it was serving your pocket. It was serving your ego 
at that time, which, you know, whether you, you know, are in a great relationship, in a great place in your life or not, as a, as a young guy in college, ego is important. I mean, it's still important, right? But how did you, how did you fall into selling ecstasy and, and what did that lifestyle look like for you on a day-to-day basis? You know, it started out more, more trying out different drugs and uh, just, you know, trying to, trying to make myself feel better on a daily basis. You know, you, you, you take a substance and uh, everything just kind of goes away. I was doing okay in school, but I was, I was partying a lot and being a broke kid, you know, having no money for anything growing up, you know, I saw these guys that were, that were selling that were, you know, had all the money that they needed. You know, I had really no way to pay for college to begin with, let alone, you know, enjoy myself down there. So it kind of served both both purposes. It was kind of a, a numbing, a numbing substance for the way I felt, and uh, and it you know it supported me. So I uh, I asked one of the kids, you know, can I can I start selling these for you? And and I did. And then I you know I became that guy, and I uh, was you know driving up to New York City and uh, different places to uh, to bring him back to school. So it was it was more of a, you know started off. And, and then grew, you know, and, and in hindsight, it's, it was started off as a very, you know, more low risk to a pretty substantial operation that uh, could have put me away for a really long time. Were you going to school at this time and passing your classes? I was, yeah, I was doing quite well in school. I mean, not straight A's, but, you know, probably all B's. You know, I was, I've always been pretty naturally smart. I never really had to try very hard in school. Um, which is, you know, one of the, in hindsight, it's one of the, one of the negatives of not having a good, you know, parent influence at home is, you know, I started off, you know, third, fourth grade, fifth grade, I was in like, you know, advanced classes and, and then I started, you know, just becoming more average. So you could probably look back now through a different lens and, and see the early on impact of, of, you know, what I was living through, uh, affecting me even back then. Uh, even though it, you know, it probably wasn't noticed, but you know, things probably could have been a lot different all the way through academically for me. Even in high school, I I didn't try at all. I never did homework. You know, I don't think I read a book in high school. You know, as far as a reading assignment, I would just wing everything, and I'd still get B's and C's. Was the money that was associated with the sale of ecstasy significant enough to feel like you know it, it's worth the risk here? At the time, definitely. In hindsight, I mean, it, it wasn't much, but you know, thousands of dollars when you have ten dollars is is a lot of money. Oh yeah, you're a millionaire. You're like we're rich. Yeah, you know, thousands of dollars a week, and as a college kid with you know, dollar beers and uh, <laughs> and you know, fast food, and you know, you're you're living the high life. You know, pay, I could pay for school. I could pay for my house. You know, to live in. I. I'd, uh, you know, have a car payment and auto insurance. And, you know, before that I was bumming rides and, uh, you know, scraping canned soup together. So it, uh, it, it was definitely a lifestyle, you know, major lifestyle change. All right. So around 2001, uh, things started to get much worse. Uh, your college was raided by the, your dorm room, I'm assuming, was raided by the police and you were arrested um, officially for drug trafficking. Can you take me back to the day and uh, to that day and walk me through what happened? Yeah, so I just, I was driving back to school, entering my last year of college. I had several thousand ecstasy pills on me, driving from New Jersey to uh, to North Carolina. I get, I got got to my apartment uh, actually before you know off camp off campus house right before I got there I dropped off 80 percent of what I was carrying with me to uh, a, another guy so I had uh, I even remember the name number 465 is what I got arrested with so I, I, I you know I come in you know take my shirt off you know wash my face after a long drive I'm sitting on the couch with my roommate all of a sudden we hear this like Boom, 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 and and the house we we're the house we we're in was up on stilts. We were down by the river, and it was like shaking a little bit. And all of a sudden, I hear like boom, and the door, the entry door of our house, 
blows off the hinge and an entire like SWAT team comes in. I had a three-year-old Rottweiler, that my dog at the time. She's barking and growling. They've got, you know, machine guns essentially in their hands. They're like, you better calm her down before before uh, we shoot her. So I like jump up, grab her, pull her into a bathroom, shut the door. That was it. I, I almost don't remember anything else from that point to kind of when I came to in the uh, in the police station. Just a blur. I, I got arrested. My roommate got arrested. And, uh, you know, at the blink of an eye, we're down in, um, we're down in the police station. Now you're in the police station. Your adrenaline, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, starts to eventually drop at some point. Are you in classic denial with what the hell just happened? Or like, where's your headspace at that point? I've actually never, never told anyone this, anyone ever. So I'm, um, you know, the typical police move. They they separate the two, the two uh, people in different rooms, like kind of like a, you know, I don't know if interrogation room is the right word, but two two little rooms separate from each other to get you know differing stories, I guess. And I think they were talking to him first, so I was sitting in there for a good while. I'm just thinking, like, how in the world am I ever going to get out of this one? Like, I've gotten out of everything else. Basically, that I've ever gotten myself into, how on earth am I going to get myself out of this? And I look down, I'm just sitting in a chair, there's a little table, and there's the other chair, which the police officer would be sitting in talking to me in a few minutes. And I remember looking at the, the, the leg of the chair, and it was kind of pointing in the bottom. And I said, I, was, I thought to myself, I wonder if I can plunge that into my neck hard enough and just kill myself right here and not go through this next stage of what, of God knows what's going to happen. And I, I don't, I don't remember exactly if the, one of the officers walked in at that point or if I just, just, you know, let it pass. But I was right there, you know, about to take an attempt on that. How long were you actually held? We got, you know, both got interrogated. We sat in a holding cell. A, like a bail bondsman came in, or we, I guess we made a phone call home first. I think I, when, when they initially came in my apartment, it was probably four or five in, in, in the evening. So I don't remember when that phone call was made, maybe 10, 11 at night. It was hours later. Who'd you call? My mother and. Actually, I didn't even speak to my mother. I, I asked to speak to uh, my stepfather, my third stepfather, <laughs> second stepfather, third father, uh, who, who they're, they're still married. Because you, because you felt that he would be in a better situation to handle this? Uh, yeah, a better one to talk to, for sure. So I, I explained what happened. And you know, maybe I talked to him for a minute explain what happened. And then uh, I guess they, they dealt with a, a bail bondsman to, um, you know, post the bond or bail or whatever, whatever it is to, uh, to let us, you know, get out or let me get out. And my uh, roommate did the same, you know, parents did the same thing. So we spent, I think, I think we were sitting in like a holding cell all night. Cause I remember walking back to my apartment a couple, like probably two miles with him from the police station at like, 5 a.m. So I think we were there, you know, 12 hours in all and, you know, walked home. Our door was like nailed shut. So we had to like climb up our back balcony and like go through a window to get into our house. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 was an, it was an all night affair. Looking back on this in retrospect now, I have so many different questions. I want to get, I want to get to the right one. So, okay. So now you're out. Your parents know what you did you're having to deal with everything that's going on in your life. But let's not forget that you were still in school. So your school has to make a decision and figure out what the hell to do with you. And they weren't sure. They let you, because this was around graduation time, they let you walk, but they held your diploma while you were awaiting trial. So now here you are, a college graduate, you have no diploma to prove it, and now you have to go out and get a job. You have it. You don't know what your sentence is going to be, and you wind up at a construction management company getting a job. What did you tell them 
about the college situation or did you not tell them anything and you were able to get away with not telling them anything? Yeah. So, um, I just told them, you know, that I graduated, which technically was true. <laughs> I did walk in graduation, have photos to prove it. And that was it. You know, there was there, that first job where there was minimal questions asked. They didn't ask for, you know, a copy, copy of the diploma or, or grades or, you know, transcripts or anything. So I kind of got through that, that initial hire. So that was, you know, a year after I got arrested. And another year later, so a good two, maybe a little over two years after I got arrested, a uh, year into working, it was, you know, approaching the trial date. Actually, for about a year, you know, the whole first year of, of working there, there was potential trial dates where I was like, oh shit, you know, what's going to happen? Like, am I going <laughs> to, I have a job right now and then I'm going to go to jail. And, and then it would get delayed and then it would get pushed back and pushed back. And, and um, finally, about a year, year and a half into working and doing really well, you know, turning everything around pretty much like, you know, being really good at what I was hired to do, really setting myself up for advancement. D-Day was there and, uh, and I had to go to trial. You've got this elephant that's on your chest, right? This, Im- this impending D-Day, like you say. Like, how are you, you know, going through your day-to-day? Obviously, you're digging into work and you're doing well there. But, you know, if I had a, if I had a stress, you know, monitor on you, an EKG on you, would you just be sitting in adrenaline every single day? I'm sure I was. I mean, I, at the time, I was so conditioned to it. Again, in hindsight, I've probably been so conditioned my entire life of dealing with high stress and high anxiety that it was just my typical state. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and I I I think over the years I developed such an incredible you know ability to bury things that I could almost black out the situation in my mind ninety nine percent of the time, and then ev- occasionally it would be you know I'd remember oh shit you know. I got something coming up here or whatever, whatever memory popped in this particular one was, you know, wow, this is, it's not just something I, you know, can wake up from and, and it's never going to, you know, come to fruition. Like eventually I'm going there. So there'd be definitely be days where it was super high anxiety. Like if one of those trial dates was coming up and, and I had no idea, you know, how I was even going to take off, let alone <laughs> potentially not come back. So yeah, it, it, I mean, for sure it's, it was, an extremely unhealthy condition to be living in. I, I did then what pretty much I did until very recently and, and just buried my problems underneath work and just locked in and, and worked my tail off and you know just kind of tried to forget everything that was going on outside of that. So you got really, really good at compartmentalizing things. Yeah, that's a great word for it. Exceptional ability to compartmentalize things. And that goes for that situation and pretty much every other negative in my life. I, I was I was an expert on putting it in a box, closing the lid and locking it. Well, the the confusing part of that as you're as we're going to get to in a minute is that you know you think that you're putting it in a box and you're not dealing with it, but that box rears its ugly head in the form of your subconscious and you start making decisions that are you know, not in your best interest and you wind up you know, having to do the work. It's kind of like a pay me now or pay me later thing. Mm-hmm. But you're two years into the job and your trial date is getting closer and you, you have to say to your boss, you know, hey, look, I need, a, I need a couple of days off. You don't tell them why. And you're going off to North Carolina for sentencing. What was going through your head on that drive up there? Similar to when I was sitting in that in that holding cell, um, not the you know suicidal thought, but just the thought of like, you know, every decision I made up up until that day, you know, led me to this, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. One, one of the things that you have to be really good at in in our in my field in construction is, you know figuring out solutions to problems. And that's something I was great at and, uh, you know, innately, I guess, over, over the years. And I was just, I remember just thinking over and over again, like I have zero control over the outcome of what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I am just, you know, blown in the wind and 
I, who knows where this is going to go? I may not be driving home. I may I may be driving back to New, New Jersey in ten years. I don't even know how I slept that night. I did a little bit, I believe, but it, it was it was a very scary, very uh, uncertain trip. So now you walk in to the courthouse. You're in front of the judge. Are you by yourself? Uh, my stepfather came with me, and then and then and then my attorneys, and actually my roommate. We both had the same attorney, so both of our pleas were were simultaneous. We, like we we basically pled at the same time. And were you guys both next to each other during sentencing? Uh, yeah, I, I, as far as I remember, we were both kind of sitting there at the same time, and and you know stood up individually to 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 plead guilty. And did the attorneys tell you what the options potentially that the judge can give you on the low end and the high end? Yeah, the high end, I believe, was uh, like two to th- two to three years in jail. The what we were hoping for and what he was fairly confident in getting, but he's you know wouldn't say it, w- it was certain was um, some form of probation and um, you know parole and probation uh, for a per- for a period of time. How long were they tracking you? It, you know, they never said. I, I don't think it was very long. I think they had a uh, a. Well, I know they had a uh, con- uh, CI, a con- confidential informant, mm-hmm. and I don't think it was very long. Uh, in 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 hindsight, I I think it was a guy that my roommate was um, talking to. You know, just in the in the couple of days prior, about you know buying some stuff that you know would be coming down in a couple of days. That's kind of what we've pieced together over the years. But um, yeah, we, I don't think it was very long. All right. So let's, we're going to wrap this up and then I have a couple of questions on, uh, we're going to wrap this part of the story up. So things started to change for you. Around 2007, you know, you were, you were, you were officially expelled from school after this sentence happens. And, you know, here you are, you go to college, you got you get a four-year degree, you walk, and then the school says, well, because of this, we're not going to give you your diploma and you're expelled. So you wind up being retroactively expelled. Then in 2007, out of the blue, your college says, just kidding. (laughs) We're going to give you your diploma. Why do you think that happened? I'm a big believer in, in karma. Once I was, you know, fortunate enough just to get probation for two years, parole probation for two years, you know, I was laser focused on just starting to, you know, work towards, you know, personal development and, and, and particularly achievement through my career. And uh, I was climbing the ladder very, very rapidly, you know, and, and starting to come clean. I, I, I got a new job shortly after I, um, I had my uh, you know, probation sentence. I got a new job on a really prestigious project in, in, a, in a huge company. And I told the guy, you know, I did graduate, you know, the HR guy, I told him I, I did graduate, but if you, you know, I, I got in trouble and, and they wouldn't give me my diploma, you know, basically it came clean to him. And I said, so, you know, if you do a background check, that's what's going to happen. Um, it was stupid, you know, it was a stupid situation I got in, but, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. And he said, all right, I, I appreciate you being honest with me. And it, it never came up again. I think karma was 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 coming back around for me, and and I was living the good life, so to speak. So I think that's why it happened. I mean, it was completely random. I just got a phone call one day at work saying, uh, actually, no. <laughs> so so I got a phone call from my wife, uh, who wasn't my wife at the time. I think she was my fiance, and she said, um, "Do you have anything to tell me?" I said, mm, "Not that I know of. What's up?" And she said. Uh, don't you love those questions from the wife, <laughs> loaded, so, by the way? Loaded. Yeah. Do, do you have anything to tell you? Yeah. You mean about my girlfriend? Oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. So luckily, I had no life and, uh, and uh, zero opportunity to have a girlfriend at that time. So um, <laughs> I knew that was off <laughs> the I table. Tell my wife. I tell my wife all the time, wh- I, these people who have affairs, I'm like, where do they get the yeah. time? Seriously. So uh, yeah, so I said, not that I know of. What's up? She goes, well, you 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 got a letter from East Carolina University saying they've decided to award you your diploma. She's like, um, what does that mean? So that was oh, she never knew she about never this? knew about it. No, I never I never told her that story. So um, oh wow, yeah, I said, well, 
I'll leave work in a little bit and I'll tell you this in person. And uh, so I, I had to explain that story. Kind of was spinning it as, hey, this is a great day. <laughs> <laughs> I never expected this to happen. <laughs> right. I mean, this, this, I mean, this is like, you know, talk about like, this is like, you know, angry sex. Like, I don't know which way to go on this one. I'm thrilled that I just graduated what I actually <laughs> did graduate. Now I'm starting all yeah. over again with my yeah. life. As a, as I a mean, pathological is, liar with my, you know, new fiance. <laughs> right. Now she's saying, well, uh, your fiance, right. Now she's saying like, what else, what else? A hundred percent. That was exactly the, uh, the tone of the conversation. What else are you keeping from me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, then, then the energy really started to shift for you in a positive way. And you started really having a string of successes in your life. You started to, you know, with your construction company, you started to build some landmark projects like, you know, Frank Gehry's Lewis Library uh, at Princeton and the Red Bull Arena, the Conrad Hotel and Battery Park and over a half a billion dollars in construction projects. And, uh, then you wound up starting your own building company in 2012, and you you know you hit the Inc. 500 of 5,000 fastest growing private companies three years in a row. Like in 2016, you're number 57. 2017, 1250, and 2018, 34. 11. I mean, so you're you're just rocketing here. What do you think, looking back on all of this in its totality? What I mean, we're all on this planet. We're all spiritual beings, I believe, to learn lessons. And you know, you included. You certainly had your share of them. But looking back on this now, why do you think that you needed these lessons? How has it served you? Maybe is a better question. It's funny. Um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that over the past year or so. You know, I think a lot of people look at. You know, no, having some some troubles and and coming through them and, and and having some success and looking at it as you know, in spite of all those, you know, in spite of my situation, in spite of my biology or geography, you know, I was able to achieve this. And lately, I've been I've been thinking pretty opposite of that. That you know, I'm achieving all of this because of those things that I went through. So, because I, I spend a lot of time looking back and trying to get the lessons out of them, and and not burying them anymore, because burying them wasn't serving me very very well. You know, burying burying those those trials and tribulations really was just was just building up a you know a, a volcano waiting to erupt. So I, I I spent a lot of time in the past year, you're know, looking back and and you know trying to understand from different different angles, different lenses. You know what should I have taken out of that? You know what what how how have I become from this incident? I, I might not have gotten that lesson if if this never happened to me. And and less of a pity, woe is me, you know, excuse lens than you know just a, a learning opportunity and 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 really a piece of your story. I, I think is what I, I've I've come to the conclusion of that all of these you know different acts are just another chapter in my story. And, and if I can spend the rest of my life passing those, those lessons learned down onto other people, then it will be, you know, it will all have been worth it. How do you take this story and share it with your children or, or do you not? You know, that, that's, that's one of the reasons why I had, I had the idea of, you know, having this discussion was to get it out there um, to my kids, to people that you know know me through you know family or or friendship contacts or business wise, you know whatever. Because I've always had this this fear that you know just like the the fear of my former employers finding out that I I have a felony and and you know didn't have a diploma when I was working for them at the time. It's the deep dark secret that you don't want right. out there, and and not for a reason that you know that a PR company would want to you know control the flow of the story or control the narrative. It's more like if they knew this about me, you know, would they still like me? Would they still love me? And that fear, just like the the anger of you know different disappointments over the years, would eventually just keep. You know, rearing its head and 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 coming out in in you know in lack of emotional control and anger in completely unrelated 
you know, topics and, and, and situations. So I, I, I wanted to get that out and kind of free myself of that. And, and, and so I have nothing to hide. You know, it's public knowledge, <laughs> really public knowledge being on this. And, and then, you know, use it as a, as a, as a lesson, to, you know, for people to learn. And, and if other people that I know are going through one out of these 40 stories that, you know, they can reach out to me and talk to me about it and, you know, give them advice and, and, uh, and, you know, let them know how I got through it at the time or how I would look back on it now. Well, I am super proud of your willingness to do this. I think that this is the exact right time the exact right place for you to um, to share this. And when you live your life with this level of authenticity and vulnerability, what will happen, because I've done this, things like this personally and with other guests, what happens is you, you start connecting with other people on a real level and you start helping them. And then what happens is they start reaching out to you and they're saying, dude, I had this thing and I've been carrying it forever and it was your it was your courage that allowed me to share it and it's always the person that thinks that their story is the one that is this giant story and you know when they compare it to somebody else's the other person is like dude wait till you hear mine <laughs> you know what I mean you're, you're exactly right you know I, emotional intelligence by Daniel Goleman was a book given to me by um, by my mentor and I've I've passed that book along to many people since. And, and that's, that's, that's the whole concept that I've, I've gotten out of that book is, you know, you never know what someone else is going through. So their reaction to you or their response to you in, in one particular topic may be completely, their response may be completely unrelated to what you're dealing with, you know, with them on and something that they're dealing with at home or at work or a sick, you know, relative or, or whatever it is. So you're hundred percent right. You know, that's, that's, that's where people, you know, need to, uh, need to realize, you know, you, you can be looking at someone that's achieved a lot of, you know, success in certain areas of their life and you have no idea what they're going through in their personal life or, or underneath all that. So just having that understanding. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So before we wrap up over here, I just want to hit you with uh, some rapid fire round questions. Answer as quickly or as slowly as you like. It's basically a first thing that comes to mind rounds. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? I would say time management and the ability to get a lot done. What's one of the things you're afraid of right now? Not living up to my potential. What keeps you up at night? How do I live up to my potential? What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? I think we're talking about it right now. How, how did you do it? Yeah, that, that, that one went right into the home plate. Yeah, there. yeah. What's the one thing that you want to get better at? Relationships. You know, being, being, uh, being more open. If you had to give a TED Talk on nothing that you're known for and nothing that you speak about, and it can really be on anything that you have a passion for, what would it be? So in the past two years, I've lost 26 pounds. You know, diet, exercise, all that is, is, is were factors, but uh, I'm fascinated by the different things you can do to control your metabolism. So I would say um, playing with your metabolism and, and speeding it up and, and and monitoring it. That's a great one. Okay, last question. Let's change it up. What one question would you like to ask me? Where do you see the whole work hard, play play hard brand going uh, over the next you know handful of years, five years plus? Well, in the next in the next year or two, it'll be solidifying solidifying the uh, the mastermind. Right now, um, you know, we have three locations: Boston, St. Petersburg, Russia, and uh, and Italy. So there's a lot that's involved in making sure that that's a home run and delivering uh, what I promised there. So for the next year or two, it'll be around curating amazing destinations. But long term. I want to get it to a $5 million company and I want to be able to share the work hard, play hard philosophy into corporations um, that need it because they'll just be much more efficient if they have some kind of program that's in place that people actually like to participate in that will help their employees grow and become bigger. So the goal is to get it to uh, 5 million within uh, five years. And then I kind of want to remove the influencer, me, from it 
and just have it be a, a real standalone company. Um, and then I want to sell it to somebody bigger. Awesome. You're well on your way. I'm on my way. Thank you for that question. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Yeah, um, we, we're creating a Youth Ninja Warrior uh, Academy in New Jersey called Shore Ninja Academy. We're going to try to bring the, the fun and athletic uh, training of parkour and, and Ninja Warrior obstacles to the kids in our, in our area and, and also utilize it for um, you know, a younger aged version of you know, life coaching and, and uh, personal development, you know, confidence building. So uh, you, could, you could follow us along on that at uh, Shore Ninja Academy on both uh, Instagram and Facebook. And uh, if you'd like to follow me and, and the building company, it's at MP Consulting. Well, brother, I cannot thank you enough for your willingness to share this story. And I know it's going to help a lot of people out there. I appreciate it, Rob. Really good time. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live. 